Hello, I'm Shelly Quinn. We welcome you to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. This quarter, we are studying the Psalms and we're learning so much. We want to thank you for joining us because we do this for you and it's such a privilege that we get to study and share this with you. Our lesson today is lesson 10 already, lessons of the past. It will be another anointed study because we have some anointed Bible students here. Let me introduce the panel, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be with you, Shelley, and the panel. I have Monday's lesson, Remembering History and the Praise of God. Amen. And Pastor John Dinsey. You know, this uh, study in Psalms has been a blessing to me. I have Tuesday this time, Remembering History and Repentance. Amen. And my precious sister in Christ, Jill Morricone. Thank you, Shelley. On Wednesday, we look at the parable of the Lord's Vine. And that sounds good, like it's going to be one of my favorites. And we then have Pastor Ryan Day. Amen. I have Thursday's lesson entitled, The Lord's Supremacy in History. Ooh, this is going to be great. You know, we don't always follow everything that's written. We're not up here just reading the quarterly to you. So our notes are often we are enhancing or we're narrowing down, but then uh, kind of dissecting something. And many people like our notes. And guess what? You can now email us and get signed up for our notes. Once you email us, they'll just start coming to you weekly. You email Sabbath, excuse me, SSP at 3abn.org. Just do that email once, you'll get on the list and you will get a copy of the illustrious notes <laughs> of this panel. <laughs> oh, I, Jill. Would you please say our opening prayer? Absolutely. Holy Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and mm -hmm. we thank you for the lessons that we see in the past yes. and how you have led and how we can look forward with eager expectation to the future. Mm -hmm. God, we ask for clean hands and a pure heart mm -hmm. for the anointing of your Holy Spirit as we study together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and I love that. We study together. Okay. Lessons of the past. This week we are going to dive into the historical Psalms. Some of them appeal to God's people to learn from history. Don't repeat the same mistakes that you've made in the past or that your ancestors have made in the past. Other, other Psalms are highlighting God's great deeds and it builds our trust as we see what God did on behalf of his covenant people. When we think about what he did in the past, this strengthens us because God is an up close and personal God. Yahweh is his covenant name and he hears, he sees, and he acts on our behalf. So what we're going to do is look at how God is able to deliver us from present hardships. Mm -hmm. These Psalms take on the form of praise and such is the memory verse. This is narrating his mighty acts of salvation. Psalm 78 verses three through four talks about what that which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us we will not hide them from our children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. Do you realize as Christians, we are adopted into the family of God, into the historic people of God through Christ Jesus. So. When we read the Psalms, this helps us to see our lives as part of God's people. We all play a small part in the history of what God is doing as he works out his sovereign will in the great controversy. Let's look at Sunday, Psalm 78. Sunday is, I love this, the Lord's unstoppable 
faithfulness. Mm. God can't help himself. God mm. is faithful. <laughs> so Psalm 78, Asaph recites three historical periods of Israel's past. We see the Exodus in verses 9 through 54, the settlement in Canaan in verses 55 through 64, and the time of David in 65 through 7, 72. Now, here's the interesting thing. This Psalm 78 marks a sharp contrast between God's faithfulness and Israel's unfaithfulness. Mm. You're going to see recurring lesson that a, a, a recurring incident, the mistakes they kept making. We want to learn from their mistakes. He's warning, actually, this psalm is to warn future generations. Don't do as your ancestors did. Let's look at Psalm 78. We're just going to concentrate on verses 6 through 12. He writes, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. Why? For this purpose, that they may set their hope in God mm -hmm. and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, mm -hmm. and that they may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright mm. and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, were turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in His law and they forgot His works, the wonders that He had shown them and the marvelous things He did in the sight of their fathers. Throughout the Psalms, we see the wondrous acts, the glorious acts of the Lord clearly demonstrated, but we also see the consequences for the people that He had invited into covenant with Him, that intimate relationship. When they rejected Him, He rejected them. So we see the consequences of breaking covenant with God. You know, it's interesting. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, if I could just see a miracle of the Lord, I'd believe. Mm. Guess what? When, the, when he brought the Hebrews out of Egypt at the Red Sea, God parts the Red Sea. Mm. The waters are heaped up on either side. They go through on dry ground and all of the Hebrew children are going, Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. There, he is my strength and my salvation. Three days later, <laughs> three days later, yeah. they arrive at Marah. The waters are bitter. They are bitterly complaining. Mm. The miracle didn't change their heart. Mm. Then they go on to Elam and then they get to the desert of sin. What are they doing in the desert of sin? That's the name of a desert. Yeah, they're sinning in the desert of sin. That's right. But they get to the desert of sin and now they're whining and complaining. Oh, God's brought us out here to die. We don't, they wanted the food, the delicacies that they'd had before. God brings quail to them. He rains down the manna, mm. angels bread and these people are never satisfied. They're always testing God because they wanted the things that they fancied. Now, the fourth stopover before they get to Mount Sinai, they're at Rephidim. Once again, mm. we're out here. You brought us out here to die. Whine and complain and moan. They forgot the God's works of the past. Mm -hmm. And he showed them miracle after miracle at Rephidim. He splits the, the rocks mm -hmm. and the water comes rushing out. Yeah. Over and over, God proved his faithfulness to them. Mm -hmm. But over and over, they were unfaithful. Mm -hmm. So they did not trust God. They did not put their trust in God, they put him to the test. So Psalm 78 verse 22 shows us that Israel's great sin 
is because they did not believe in him or trust in his salvation. God continuously showed them covenant love, continuously. And when they forgot his past wonders, they neglected his covenantal requirement. And guess what? That's why they were unsuccessful in battle. Human efforts apart from God's faithfulness are futile. Let's look at Psalm 78, verse 32. In spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore, their days he consumed in futility and their years in fear. Mm. They chose this. Wow. Isn't that sad? Wow. This is the consequences of their actions. When he slew them, then they sought him and they returned and sought earnestly for God. Then they remembered that God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. Nevertheless, woo, this one's a wake up call. They flattered him with their mouth and they lied to him with their mm. tongue. Mm. For their heart was not steadfast with him, nor were they faithful to his covenant. Mm. We can make great boast about our Christian walk. We can flatter and say, praise the Lord. But if we're not walking in covenant faithfulness, we're in trouble. But look at verse 38, Psalm 78, 38. But he, anytime we start off with, but God, mm -hmm. being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity, did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away. He did not stir up all his wrath, for he remembered they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted, they tried, they tested God. And look at this. Oh, don't miss verse 41. Again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. How did they limit God? Verse 42 tells us, they did not remember his power the day when he had redeemed them from the enemy. We limit God by our faithlessness. Mm -hmm. Did you hear me? Yeah. If you want God to prove faithful to you, you've got to believe in him. Psalm 78, 58 says, they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their carved images over and mm -hmm. over again. So the lesson to be learned from Psalm 78, don't make the same mistake over and over. Mm -hmm. Trust in God, remain faithful to his mm -hmm. covenant. And we have to have our will grounded in the covenant will of our Lord. Amen, amen, amen Shelley. Psalm 78, and then we move to Psalm 105. I'm James Rafferty and we have, uh, I have Monday's lesson, which is remembering history and the praise of God. Psalm 105, we're looking at what historical events and their lessons are highlighted in this psalm. So we're going to start in 105 verses 1 through 4. Let's just take a look at these verses and see, again, the historical events and their lessons that are highlighted in this psalm. O oh, give thanks, verse 1, unto the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the people, sing unto Him, sing psalms unto Him, talk ye of all His wondrous works. Glory ye in His holy name, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and His strength, seek His face evermore. You see the emphasis in these verses, don't you? The emphasis in these verses is all about the Lord. It's, it's telling us that we should give thanks to the Lord. It's telling us that we should call upon the Lord. It's telling us that we should make known His deeds among the people. It says we should sing unto Him. We should sing psalms unto Him. We should talk about His wondrous works. We should glory in His holy name. We should let the heart rejoice that Amen. seeks the Lord. We should seek the Lord. We should seek His strength. We should seek Him forevermore. By the way, that word evermore is really an interesting word in the Greek. It's tamid, tamid. And this word is used all through the Bible, especially we see this word in Daniel chapter yes. 8. Yes. 
Yes. And Daniel chapter 11. The tamid is the daily. The tamid is the continual. The tamid is that thing which is taken away by the little horn, the Antichrist power yeah. in the book of Daniel. The tamid is that thing which is uh, foundational to our Christian experience. It was just explained in verses 1, 2, and 3. What is the tamid? What is this continual? The continual lamp that was burning in the holy place pointed to Jesus Christ, the light of the world. The continual showbread that was there in the holy place pointed to Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The continual incense that was flowing pointed to the merits of Jesus Christ. The continual sacrifice, the continual ministry of the priest. Everything in the sanctuary, which is the gospel in types, the gospel of the Old Testament, all of that pointed to Jesus, the continual, the regular, that which we should be depending upon all of the time. So verses 1, 2, and 3 of Psalm 105 are actually describing the tamid. They're describing that which we need to do all of the time. We Amen. always need to be seeking the Lord, always relying on the, upon the Lord, always looking to the Lord. In fact, there's a really powerful reference here of God's people in the last days in Isaiah chapter 58. Now we're not going to look at all of Z Isaiah 58. It would be good for us to do that because it would give us the context and the context is powerful. But Isaiah 58 specifically we're going to look at verses 11, 12, and 13 because this word tamid, the daily, the regular, the continual is found here in Isaiah chapter 58 describing God's people in the last days. Notice verse 11, and the Lord shall guide thee Continually. Yeah. Guess what that word is? Me? Oh. The tamid, me, the continual, the regular. The Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like springs of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places and thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations and you will be called the repair of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Here it is, verse 13. If thou turn thy foot away from the Sabbath from doing thy pleasure on my holy day called the Sabbath of delight, holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob, thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. But to me, the continual is the foundation for Sabbath keeping. The, the foundation for relationship with Christ. And you think about this because when you have this relationship with Christ, the Sabbath comes along and you're like, yes, yes. I'm not working today. I'm not taking any phone calls today from my business. I'm not doing any kind of, of uh, secular focus today. Today, it's time for this continual relationship with Christ, this regular, continual settling into Jesus Christ, focusing on Him, worshiping Him, praising Him, giving thanks to Him, singing to Him, glorifying Him. And by the way, we want to do this not by ourselves, but in the presence of the body of Christ. Why? Because the body of Christ has a need of us. Mm -hmm. The body of Christ has many parts, tongues, eyes, ears, hands, feet. And the body of Christ has a need for us and we have a need of the body. Yes. Yes. So we edify the body, the body edifies us. Now sometimes it doesn't feel like we're getting edified by the body, if you know what I mean. Sometimes you can be part of the body and it's like, oh man, that's not feeling good. But remember what we talked about in our last lesson, we talked about Joseph and we talked about how God used him to preserve life. He didn't feel like he was being used. He felt like he was being abused, especially by his family, right? And that's the thing about family. We are family here, but sometimes family is dysfunctional and you have to work through some issues, but it's okay because we're family. We're the family of God and we can work through those issues. But in the end, like Joseph, we can look back and we can say, you know what? God is overruling everything that's happened to me for good, right? Amen. He's bringing all, th he's bringing good out of all of this. And our focus then is going to be on this relationship with God because God is gonna speak to us. He's gonna tell us what's going on in our life right now and the struggles we're going through and how he's going to bring good out of those struggles, those trials that we're going through. So Psalm 105 says, remember verse five, his marvelous works that he has done and his wonders and his judgments, the judgments of his mouth. Oh, you seed of Abraham, you servants, you children of Jacob, he chose in verse seven, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. 
He has remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. He has remembered his covenant. And verse 10, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. God is the one that is doing all of this. Mm -hmm. Saying unto thee, I will give thee the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance, when they were but few men in number, yea, very few and strangers in it. And when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sake, saying, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. And the thing about this is, you know, we know the story of Abraham and, and also of Isaac, you know, because uh, in, in Genesis 26, uh, verse 7, you know, even Isaac followed his father's example and lied about his wife being his sister. And, you know, God says, yep, but you're not going to touch him. Even when we are in our failures, God still puts his hand over mm -hmm. us, right? He still, he still puts his hand over us. And I like this because as the lesson says, Psalm 105 recalls the key events that shape the covenantal relationships between the Lord and his people. It focuses on God's covenant with Abraham to give him the promised land and to his descendants. And this promise and how it was confirmed to Isaac and Jacob and how it was providentially fulfilled through Joseph, right? Moses and Aaron. And in a time of the conquest of Canaan, uh, God through the Psalms gives us hope that God's people in all generations can re receive the promises that he's made to us in spite of the circumstances that surround us. Mm. We're little, we're not sure we can do this, uh, we're in a land of strangers, uh, we're not the rulers here, we're under bondage and affliction. Whatever it is that our circumstances uh, today, that present us today, our circumstances present today, we can look back on the history that's recorded in the Bible and we can see, well, God delivered his people in the past. Mm -hmm. God was able to get them through the circumstances and overrule these circumstances circumstances in the past. And so God can work for us today. In fact, we're told in Testimonies, Volume 8, page 107, all who profess to be children of God, I would invite to consider the history of the Israelites. The history of the Israelites? What's that got to do with us? The history of the Israelites is recorded in the 105th ooh, and 106th That's Psalms, right? By carefully studying these scriptures, we may be able to appreciate more fully the goodness, the mercy, and the love Amen. of our God. Amen. And then it quotes, Moreover, brethren, I would not have ye be ignorant how that we all of our fathers were under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all did eat that spirit, same spiritual meat and did drink that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. The, the God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And then it continues on. 8T, or excuse me, T, this is TM page 98. The experience of Israel referred to in the above words by the apostle and is recorded in the 105th and 106th Psalms contains lessons of warning that the people of God in these last days especially need to study. I urge that these chapters be read at least once every week. So here's the bottom line for us. The world inundates us with distractions mm -hmm. that take us away from God. And one thing is needful. Mary chose that one part and we are to be like her. Don't get so busy in the world that you can't have that Tamid experience with God, the Tamid experience with God, that you can't enter into that experience, that continual experience of looking to God, praising God, singing praises to God, glorifying God, and sharing the testimonies of His leading in your life. Amen, that was wonderful. I need to do a study on the Tamid. We are going to take a quick break. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three Avian Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. And now we continue with Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much. My name is John Dinsey and I have Tuesday's lesson, which continues the history of the people of Israel. Now I begin with reading 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. 
Now, all these things happen unto them for examples. Mm -hmm. And they are written for our admonition yes. upon whom the ends of the world are come. And this is talking to us living today. Uh, really, we are living in the end of times. And as we look at the history of Israel and the things that happened to them, we should see something that identifies with us. So let's go ahead and begin Psalm 106, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His mercy endures forever. Now, this is an interesting way to begin this or continue this because really uh, it's a history of Israel that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, because as you look at the history of the people of Israel and really throughout the Bible, you see that God is good, that God is merciful, that He takes care of His children, that He protects His children until they rebel, they disobey. Then God has to remove protection. And sometimes uh, we see that they were taken captive by other nations. Verse 2, who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare all His praise? God continues daily to do wonderful things, miraculous things, and nobody can really number all the wonderful things that He does. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. Well, I think on this panel we can all say we don't all do righteousness all the time, <laughs> but there's a blessing for those that do that which the Lord, Lord calls upon them to do. And may the Lord help us to do righteousness all the time, I would Amen. say. Now, remember me, O Lord, it says in verse 4, with the favor you have toward your people, O visit me with your salvation. Mm -hmm. This is a longing desire to be blessed according to the way the Lord has blessed His children in the past. Mm -hmm. And really, when you see the Lord blessing people in the past, you can say, wow, I would like that blessing, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> you can ask the Lord to give you the same blessing, and He is willing to do that. And one of the things that I liked, you know, uh, we see there uh, Jesus on the road to Emmaus with the disciples, it says that He opened their understanding. Yes. yes. Ah, yes, this is something I want. Even as we look at Psalms 106, I have to say, Lord, what can we have? What can we see here that is for us today? And this is why I started uh, with uh, the scripture that I did, because it was written for our admonition. Yes. Let's continue in verse 6. Actually, let's go to verse 5. That I may see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Yes, he was able to look back and see that they were benefited by God. They were blessed by God and uh, that you can rejoice in the way that they were blessed. So you can ask the same blessing. Psalms 106, verse 6. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. You see the progression there of identifying with the sins of the people. But this is really saying we have done the same evil they have done. Mm. So we are in the same category that they are. And that's why he's uh, appealing to God to be also merciful. Let's continue in verse 7. 106 verse 7, our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Oh, this is something that applies to us today. Do we not understand God's wonders, God's miracles? He does them every day. And if you stop and consider them, you will know that God is continually doing miracles. It is by God's miracle and blessing that plants grow, Vegetables grow, fruits grow. These are miracles the Lord continues to do. And despite all of the things that the people are doing to destroy this world, contamination and all kinds of ex experiments being done to the food, the Lord is coming soon. Uh, I mean, even as I consider that they're changing the food you eat, the Lord must come soon. Mm. Verse 8, Nevertheless, He saved them for His name's sake, that He might make His mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and, dry, and it dried up. So He led them through the depths as through the wilderness. This is another marvelous miracle of the Lord. They were being pursued by the Egyptians. They thought they were going to die, but God opened up the sea for them, and they walked on dry land. Praise be to the Lord. Psalms 106, verse 10, He saved them from the hand of him who hated them. 
and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Mm -hmm. The waters covered their enemies and there was not one of them left. Then they believed his word. They sang his praise. They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. We see here the same thing that happens to us. They saw, wow, look at how wonderful, what a deliverance. Mm -hmm. He saved us. And they sang praise. Man, it's like the next verse. They forgot. Mm. They forgot how God delivered them. Do you forget yes. the way God has blessed you from one day to the next? Mm. Do you forget that He has been good to you, merciful to you? Do you ask God, forgive me for my sins, Lord? But moments later or a day later or an hour later, you go back into sin again. May you remember that God is merciful, has been good to you. Do not forget and so let's move to verse 14. But lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. Mm. Here we have uh, something interesting. You know, it's, uh, in, this is the King James I quoted. Uh, but in the New King James, it said they tested God in the desert. And I think this is more accurate to say they tempted God. It's like they continually wanted to do evil and it was a, it was like a test and a temptation. They want, it's like they're, they're asking God to, to bring them something that is not for their benefit. Mm -hmm. And they were lusting for something that was not gonna be good for them. And so the Lord said, this is what you want. This is what you get. Be mm -hmm. careful what you ask of the Lord. You may be asking for trouble that you don't need to go through. So let's move to verse 16. When they envied Moses in the camp and Aaron, the saint of the Lord, the earth opened up and swallowed Dathan and covered the faction of Ab uh, Abiram or Abiram, whichever way you pronounce it. And so this is another instance. You know, God has his leaders. God has his people that he has chosen, put them in places. And these people wanted the position that Moses had. And so uh, the Lord was angry and the Lord had to take action. And we have to be careful. Sometimes we, um, you know, we are, we are to, uh, they went from holding up the arms of Moses to tr trying to take his position. And this is dangerous. Sometimes, you know, uh, there's the pastor preaching and then they say, well, you have, they used to say in Spanish, you have the pastor for lunch because you start criticizing, oh, did you see this? Did you hear that? And this is a dangerous thing. We have to remember that God has his people in places for a reason that he knows is best. I see the time is escaping, so I need to advance here to something I, I wanted to highlight. I have to move to Psalms 106, verse 37. Notice what it says there. Mm. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. This is a, uh, a, they sunk so low, so deep into sin and into confusion that the gift that the Lord gave them in their sons and their daughters, they were sacrificing to demons. The devil is very deceptive and we have to be careful, continually look to the Lord, continually follow the Lord, Tamid, you know, as, as you heard, mm -hmm. because as you're having this relationship with the Lord, you will avoid these horrible errors. And I want to bring something to you because we may not necessarily be today bringing our children and sacrificing them, but what are you exposing your children to? Mm -hmm. In the social media, in the movies, and in the uh, things they see on television. What are you doing? Are you really, in this sense, bringing your children before the devil? Do you know what they see? Do you know what they hear? Are you offering your children to the devil as a prey? Mm. So I encourage you to uh, take care of your children. The Lord has given them to you to instruct them in the way of the Lord. And how about yourself, mothers and fathers? Mm. What are you watching? What are you paying attention to? What is, has become your idol that you worship? Is it uh, consuming so much time on social media? Social media, television, uh, movies, soap operas, all of these things take our attention away from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And as it says in verse 39, thus they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. I encourage you, Take a look at Psalms 106. There are valuable lessons for us that we can take heed and make changes for our best 
benefit from the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny. That's a serious admonition for each one of us. That's powerful. And Pastor James and Shelley, what a great study. I'm Jill Morricone. On Wednesday, we look at the parable of the Lord's vine. And we're going to Psalm 80. So turn with me to Psalm 80. That's what we look at for my passage today. If you look at the historical context, Shelley did an incredible job with Psalm 78. We see the faithfulness of our God, even though Israel was not so faithful to their God. You get to the very end of Psalm 78 and you see this judgment coming against Ephraim or the northern tribes, the 10 northern tribes. We know eventually 722 BC, they were taken captive by the Assyrians and they were completely you could say wiped out or as a nation, they were integrated within the Assyrians and they were lost. We see Psalm 79 is a judgment against um, Jerusalem and Judah, the southern kingdom. We know they were taken captive um, by the Babylonians, but what happened? They were restored after those 70 years of Babylonian captivity and brought back. Psalm 80 is this plea to God for restoration. We see it three times in Psalm 80, verse 3. Psalm 80, verse 3, it says, Restore us, O God. The word restore in Hebrew literally means to return. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is a cry for repentance and restoration. God, we want to return back to you. Restore us, O God, cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. Look at verse 7, Psalm 80, verse 7. It's a very similar plea. Restore us, the same word, mm -hmm. return. Restore us, O God of hosts. How long will you be angry against the prayer of your people? Again, this plea for repentance, restoration. Again, in verse 19, you see the same plea, echo. Restore us, the same Hebrew word. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. Mm -hmm. There's a couple imageries in Psalm chapter 80. The first imagery is God is a shepherd and he's re being requested to restore his people. But the second imagery that we're going to study today, Israel is a vine transplanted from Egypt. Mm. God transplanted Israel out of Egypt from the land of oppression into the promised land, the land of abundance and freedom. In Psalm 80, verse 8, it says, you have brought a vine out of Egypt. This is talking about Israel. You have cast out the nations and planted it. So God delivered Israel, brought them out of Egypt, transplanted them in the land of Canaan. But what happens? God's vineyard, God's people, they're under judgment. Look at verse 14. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Now, a previous study, we looked at that investigative judgment in Psalms. In this passage, look down from heaven. Mm -hmm. God's coming down to investigate the state of his vineyard, the state of his people. Look down from heaven and see and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand has planted, and the branch that you made strong for yourself. God is about ready to bring judgment against his transplanted people. He planted them. He nurtured them in the past. His right hand, it says, had planted them, and he made the branch strong for himself. What happened? Look at verse 12. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? His protection that's the wall of his vineyard, is removed. Mm -hmm. He allowed invaders to come in and to take the Israelites. It's interesting to me, the Israelites previously drove out the Canaanites. Now that it's a sinful covenant people mm -hmm. who are being removed. Look at verse 16. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. God's now bringing fire and cutting down his people. The vineyard is perishing at the rebuke of his countenance. Israel, Judah's difficulties. God is using the pagan nations to bring judgment against them. Why are they under judgment? Look at Jeremiah 2. We'll come back to Psalm 80, but look at Jeremiah 2, verse 21. Yet I had planted you a noble vine, talking about Israel again, God's people, a seed of the highest quality. How then 
have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? Mm. His people disobeyed him. His people turned their back on him. The vineyard, you could say, spoiled. It turned bad. It rotted. Mm. It's amazing to me as you look at the long suffering and mercy of our God. In Isaiah 5, we won't read that whole passage, but the first few verses of Isaiah 5, God singing to his people and saying, you're my well beloved. And he gives this parable of the vineyard. And he talks about how he dug up the vineyard and he cleared out the stones and he planted it with his choicest of vines. Mm -hmm. He built a tower in the midst and a wine press and he expected good grapes. And what happened? Wild grapes came forth. And in Isaiah 5 verse 4, he says, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? And what am I going to do? It's going to be broken down mm -hmm. and burned and trampled down. We see this judgment. Going back to Psalm 80, we see this plea for divine restoration, which we've talked about those three times this comes forward. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts, cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. I wanna give you in our closing moments, three keys to revival. You and I at times have turned our back on God. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I can tell you I have. And yet God wants to restore us. No matter what state we're currently in, he wants to restore us and he wants to bring revival in our lives again. Uh, number one, key number one, revival springs from our great need. Were the people in great need, the vineyard at that time? Psalm 80 verse five, you have fed them with the bread of tears, given them tears to drink in great measure. The people were sad. The people were hopeless. The people were in deep distress. The people were lonely. Revival springs when we sense that we need God. Psalm 80 verse 6, uh, the second half of the verse, our enemies laugh among themselves. They were under ridicule and scorn from their enemies. Wow. Psalm 80 verse 12, why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? They were plundered by those who came by. So they're in a time of great need. Revival springs when you and I recognize our great need. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the need comes from without. It can be a spiritual oppression or darkness. We know that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. So there is an enemy coming against us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it comes from sin within or apathy within. You even see that in Psalm 80 verse four. God's even angry with the prayers of his people. We see that even within. Sometimes we're just stuck in the Laodicean condition in the state of apathy. Recognize our great need. That's the first key. Revival springs out of our great need when we recognize our desperate heart condition and that we need God. Number two, revival springs from God alone. What did the people do? They couldn't humanly create restoration. Mm -hmm. They couldn't return to God of themselves. We can't humanly create lasting revival in our lives and in our hearts. When true revival happens, God's people are saved. When true revival happens, God's people's lives are changed. Mm -hmm. They turn to God and they said, would you restore us? Knowing that revival only comes from God alone. Psalm 80 verse 18, it says, then we will not turn back from you. In other words, when true revival takes place, we don't turn away again. We don't walk in the way of our own choosing and do our own thing. We have our eyes and hearts focused upon God. Finally, number three, revival springs from earnest prayer. Any revival begins with prayer. And you can see the heart cry of the people. We saw that three times in Psalm 80, where they pleaded with God, please God, would you restore us? You know, sometimes we can look at other people and say, well, they really need revival in their life. My church really needs revival. I wish my pastor would preach different sermons. Not our pastor, I'm just saying, some people can say that. I wish something would take place we need to look inward. God, 
I need to see my great need of you. Mm -hmm. God, I look outward now. Only you can revive me. Only you can restore me. God, I want to spend that time in earnest prayer. Not just me individually, but gather groups of individuals. God, would you restore us as a people and as a church? God, would you restore it and let that revival begin with me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jill, for that. My name is Ryan Day, and I have uh, Thursday's lesson entitled The Lord's Supremacy in History. And we're actually going to be looking at Psalm 135. We're going to spend all of our time there. And this, this chapter is just power packed with so many great examples of how God is indeed supreme and how the historical record shows proof of that. So I'm going to jump right into verse one here. Psalm 135, verse one, it starts with praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, praise him, O you servants of the Lord. You who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. And here kind of comes the, the thesis of this entire chapter and the point that's being made here. Verse five, for I know that the Lord is great and our Lord is above all Gods, And we're about to see why that's the case. And we jump right into our first major point here, which we see the supremacy of God in the history of creation. We're going to read verses 6 and 7 here of Psalm 135, verses 6 and 7. It says, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does, in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all the deep places. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. God is creator. He can control the elements of the earth because he is creator. And we see that in the history. Without creation, there is no man. Without creation, there is no Bible. Without creation, there is no people of Israel because God himself is creator. And this was actually the very point that God was trying to establish with Job in Job chapter 38 when you read it there. And it continues over into uh, chapter 39 as well. A uh, powerful chapter there. I don't know if I'll read all these verses here, but I was just reflecting on this lesson. And this is what Job needed to be reminded of. He needed to be reminded of God's supremacy as creator of everything. And uh, Job had been questioning things. He had been brought to the point where he had put God and said, God, answer me. Give me an answer for why this is happening to me. And God speaks to him in verse four of Job 38. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? That's right. Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. And previous to this, understand, I love the, the remark he makes because he says, prepare yourself like a man. I'm going to question you. And so he's questioning Job and he's saying, look, do you, do you control these things? Do, were you there when all of these things happened? Verse 6 in Job 38, to what were its foundations fastened and who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sing together uh, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, have you commanded the morning since, the days, uh, since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? Have you entered the springs of the sea or have you walked in search of the depths? By the way, I'm reading various uh, scriptures. I'm skipping around here uh, in Job 38. I'm, in, I'm here at verse uh, 16. Have you entered the springs of the sea or have you walked in the search of its depths? Verse 19, where is the way of the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place? Verse 22, have you entered the, the treasury of snow or have you seen the treasury of hell? Verse 25, who has divided a channel for the overflowing water or the path of the thunderbolt? Verse 26, to cause it to rain on the land where there is none and a wilderness in, in which there is no man. 31, can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or have you loosed the belt of of Orion? Verse 39, can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions? Verse 40, when you crouch in their dens or when they, when they crouch in their dens or lurk in their, in their lairs or lie in wait? Verse 41, who provides food for the raven when it's young or when the young ones cry out to God and wonder about the lack of food? God is saying, where were you? I was there. I am the creator. And of course, Revelation 4 verse 11 right there very clearly brings out that you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created 
all things and by your will they exist and were created. So we see the supremacy of God in history through the creative power, his creative power, because he is the creator, not a creator. He is the sole creator. And of course, by the time you get to verses eight and nine in Psalm 135, now uh, the, the psalmist is taking you back in the history to the deliverance of Israel. God is supreme in history because we see all of the deliverance that he brought for his people, even in moments when they didn't deserve it, he was there. Notice, for instance, uh, Psalm 135 verses eight and nine. He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into the midst of you, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. So God brings deliverance. He is a delivering God and, and, and not just in a very physical sense. Obviously, he delivered Israel from their enemy at that time and, and, and in that particular instance. But, uh, you know, God is still that delivering God today. He will bring deliverance to you uh, in the time of need. And when you call out to him, he still brings deliverance. I, I, when I was studying this chapter, I thought of first, or John chapter 9, verse 25, where the blind man had just been healed of God and they were questioning him, who did this? Who is he? Did he do this by demons? And it's amazing his answer is whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know is that though I was blind, now I see. That man was delivered and he will never forget it. In fact, he will sing his praises as the the chapter says this brother I'm sure went about his life telling that story forever because he was once blind now he sees and he has a now a history with God that shows forth his supremacy in his life. We also see there in Psalm 135 verses 10, 11, and 12 we see the supremacy in the history of Israel in victory over their enemies. For instance it says in verse 10 he defeated many nations and slew mighty kings uh, Sihon king of the Amorites Og king of Bashan and the kingdoms of Canaan and gave their lands as a heritage, a heritage to Israel, uh, his people. And so God sees us past and through our enemies when they oppress. But I'll tell you, the part that really spoke to me in this chapter uh, was verses 13 to 21. Uh, I want you to hear these details. They're powerful. Verse 13 here, your name, O Lord, endures forever. And I love this, your fame, O Lord, throughout all generations. Let me tell you something. We serve a famous God. And I'm not ashamed to say it. If there's anyone that deserves fame, it's our God, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of this world, the creator of all. He is famous and he deservingly is so because of the wonders and the mighty things that he has done for his people. Verse 14, it says, for the Lord will judge his people and he will have compassion on his servants. You know, as I was studying this, I got to thinking, you never, very rarely at least, and I personally have never heard of any stories out there of someone saying, oh yes, Allah delivered me from this. Allah brought this saving grace to me. Allah uh, had compassion on me. Krishna had compassion on me. Buddha had compassion. You never hear any stories, very rarely, uh, of any other gods and what they have personally done for nations or for individuals. But you only hear those testimonies from the Christian faith because the one true God brings that compassion indeed. Verse 16, I love this. Speaking of these, uh, uh, these false idols, it says, uh, oh, well, let me go back to verse 15. The idols of the nations are silver and gold and the work of men's hands. And then notice verses 15 and 16 and onward. It says, uh, verse, six, verse 16 and onward. It says, they have mouths, but they do not speak. Yeah. Eyes they have, it says, but they do not see and have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouth. God is saying, look, how can you compare me to all these false gods? They're not even gods. They're not anything at all. Even though you could create them out of silver and gold and all of the different elements of the earth, you can make your God of the wood and the God of the grass and the God of the clouds and the God of the season, whatever other God you want to formulate in your mind or in your fantasy or in your imagination. But all of these false gods, they cannot do anything because they are dead. They don't exist, but we serve a God of the living. In fact, it's interesting that in verse 18, here's the line. If you want to, if, if I was going to tweet something or post something or Facebook something, here it is. Those who make them are like them. That's good. Right there. All those who make these false gods are like the false gods that they make. So is everyone who trusts in them. And then, of course, 19 to 21 brings 
the beautiful blessing. It says, Blessed, uh, bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion who dwells in Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. And I really, really, really it just enjoyed this, this lesson. And it, the lesson brings out here, it says, the recounting of God's great deeds on behalf of his people culminates in the promise that God will judge his people and have compassion on them. The judge here is God's vindication, or excuse me, the judgment here is God's vindication of the oppressed and the destitute. The promise is that the Lord will uphold his people's cause and defend them. Thus, Psalm 135 aims to inspire God's people to trust in the Lord and to remain faithful to their covenant with him. History proves it, that God is trustworthy. History proves that he is worthy to be worshiped. Our God is supreme in history because the historical record shows that he never fails because love never fails. Amen, amen and amen. What a fabulous lesson. We have just a couple of moments left. Closing remarks. Psalm 105 verse 4 says, Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his face evermore. And it's the face that gives recognition to people. And so God is saying, I want you to seek my face. I want you to learn how to recognize me, learn how to recognize who I am, Amen. how I operate, what my everlasting covenant is, and how I relate to you even in your fallen condition. Amen. 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 I had Psalms 106 and I want to bring to your attention that if you see some of these things in Psalms 106 in your life and you, you know you need the Lord, consider Psalms 106, 47 and 48. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting and let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. On Wednesday's lesson, we took a look at Psalm 80 and just how our God wants to restore us. It reminds me of Hosea 14. O Israel, return to the Lord your God. I will heal your backsliding and love you freely. Amen. Mm, amen. Uh, is your life a reflection and a blessing to the Lord? Or are you like those idols that you have made in your life? Uh, I just want to encourage you to turn your eyes up on Jesus. Behold him. Look full in his wonderful face, his wonderful grace for the things of the earth. What does the song say? Uh -huh. Will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes up on Jesus and give him a chance today. And may your life be a reflection of his goodness. Amen. Amen. I just want to thank each one of you. We always learn from each other as mm -hmm. we're going through this experience. We hope that you have been enjoyed this. I just wanted to remind you of one scripture from my day, and that was Psalm 78, verse 41, that says, Israel limited God mm. because they forgot about his power. Mm -hmm. Don't limit God. Remember his wondrous works. Next week, we will be studying longing for God in Zion. We hope that you will join us. Until then, our prayer is that the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with you always. Thank you.